Good evening, and welcome to the Ecstasy of Faith, a first-hand account of a Sufi grave. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of my experiences from um, all over the world, Morocco, Egypt, Turkey. Um, I've been interested in Sufism for about eight or nine years, and uh, in particular in the last six months. I've really started to immerse myself in it, and I've spent uh, about six weeks uh, recently in uh, Morocco, which is just a phenomenal place. So uh, before we get started, first things first, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Greg, and I'm one of the owners of Spirit Quest Tours. I started the company about 10 years ago um, after I had a spiritual awakening in Egypt. And so now this is kind of my mission, to travel the world. Um, so Spirit Quest Tours is a spiritual travel company. And that's, that's what we do, is we explore spirituality in places like uh, Bali, Egypt, England, France. It's, it's a good gig. It's a, it's a cool thing to do for a living, let me tell you. Uh, this was um, shot in Morocco. This, this picture is from Morocco. I was in the Sahara, and we got hit by a sandstorm, a class four sandstorm, which was a really amazing experience. You want, you want a full appreciation of the merciless power of Mother Nature? Be in the Sahara in the middle of a sandstorm. and you screw your head on straight, let me tell you. Um, so the first thing that I, I want to share with you is a, a place in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, called the Ar Rafai Mosque. And this was actually my introduction to Sufism. So this is the Ar Rafai Mosque. It looks really, really old, doesn't it? Like if you, if you were going to guess, you, what would you think? Like four, five, six centuries? Yeah. Yeah, this was actually, yeah. This is actually only 100 years old. But what's interesting about it is that it was built to be the twin to the mosque that's right next door to it called the Al Hussein Mosque, which was from the 13th century. So the story about the building of this mosque is that this is a Sufi mosque, and the, the man that was responsible for building it was the head of this Sufi order in Cairo. And the son of the last queen of Egypt was bitten by a snake, and he was dying from the poison. And this particular sect of Sufis, they're famous for having control over reptiles, over snakes, and for being able to cure people of snake bites and these kinds of things. So the queen of Egypt went to this Sufi master and got him to heal and save her son. And when he did, in out of gratitude, she donated the land and gave all of the money for the building of this mosque. And so it was built to be a twin to the mosque that's, whatever, six centuries older, that's literally right across the way. So my first visit here, yeah, it was about eight years ago, and uh, this is the inside, this is the dome of the mosque. It's, it's phenomenal, it's just such a really gorgeous, gorgeous place, and the energy here is so incredibly peaceful. And one of the interesting things to me about Sufis and Sufism, as opposed to maybe more stringent forms of Islam, is they don't care if you're a Christian or a Jew or an atheist or a Buddhist or a Hindu, they really don't care. As long as you're a seeker and you're on the path and your heart is pure, you're welcome. And so I've had some really beautiful moments in, in this mosque. And this man, is the imam of the mosque, and he's a Sufi master. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but he's actually, he's a cripple, he walks on kings. So the last king of Egypt, King Farouk, along with his mother and his three wives, are buried in this mosque, in these phenomenal mausoleums, these huge marble uh, rooms that are four stories tall, and they're connected to one another through a, a series of doors. And it's interesting, you can tell how the women in his life rated, or how they ranked, by which we bless you, by who's closest to him. And you want to guess who's actually closest to him? Mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So. so anyway, so the imam will open up the doors to all of these, uh, these mausoleums. And again, they're just absolutely beautiful. And then he goes back and he sits in the dark and he sings in this Sufi chant. 
So this is my first experience, my first exposure to Sufis and, and to Sufism. You can see, I used to have a radio show, uh, and, and this was, so this was when I recorded this, this was 2005. So it was like, what, eight, seven and a half, eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, that, that I first had Sufis and Sufism really come to my consciousness. So I'm going to play just a little bit of the audio for you of him singing in the dark. Watch his face, watch this, in this sequence. This man isn't performing, he's worshiping. So even though these guys are on, quote unquote, on stage and there's an audience, each one of them is really actively engaged, you know, with this communication, with this discipline, with this, this tradition of seeking the divine that they've been studying for years. So that was the first thing that really shocked me was, you know, when I saw this guy, I was, was blown away by the genuine emotion and feeling that was happening. And this wasn't a performance. This was genuine connection, you know. But then the other thing that happened is that after about 10 minutes, the music just got to be overwhelming. And I found that I couldn't keep my eyes open. And I had to close my eyes and fall into the rhythm of this incredible, Sufi music, and I spent the rest of this, despite the fantastic display of their virtuoso dancing and the colors and everything that they were doing, I couldn't keep my eyes open because I was so caught in the music. And afterwards, my friend, my Egyptian friend, who, who brought me, he said, my God, I didn't know you were a Sufi. I said, neither did I. But that's what happened, you know? It's like something, like my heart got it combusted in, in this evening, and I felt this resonance, this, this uh, sympathy with the music, with the tradition and everything. So uh, I really began to, to study Sufism in a more serious way. Now, if you're familiar with Sufism at all, you're probably familiar with Rumi. He's probably the, the individual that you've heard or maybe read. He's hugely influential here in the West, especially in the last 20 or 30 years. And there have been some beautiful translations of, of his work. So Rumi was a 12th century Persian poet. I'll talk more about him in just a minute. But this is one, this is one of my favorite passages of his. There's nothing left of me. I'm like a ruby held up to the sunrise. Is it still a stone or a world made of redness? The ruby and the sunrise are one. 
so to me, the, the last image that we saw of that guy in Cairo so transported, it's like he's the embodiment of these words. And this is one of the reasons why I like this passage, is that this is sort of, in some ways, the essence of Sufism. It's about this absolute union with the divine, of the individual, of the specific, with the universal, with the cosmic, with the creative principle, with God, if you will. And so this idea of you hold a ruby up to the sunrise, and suddenly the ruby goes away. You know, that's what we want to become in relation to God, and that's what ultimately Sufism is, is about. So we come back. And uh, just a couple of months after that, somebody says to me, hey, I have some tickets to this thing at Royce Hall at, at UCLA. Are you interested? It's the Mevlevi order of dervishes from Turkey. I'm like, okay, that's three times, you know, in less than six months, there's a message here from the universe. So uh, I went, and now the, the dervishes from Turkey uh, other than Rumi, if you think of Sufis or Sufism, this is probably what you see. People in white, the big tall hat, you know, that's the almost the stereotype of what a, a Sufi is. So this Mevlevi order that was performing at, uh, at Royce Hall, I had the same experience. I sat and I couldn't, my eyes, I couldn't keep my eyes open, despite the beauty of you know, the performance, because I was so, you know, just lifted by the music. So I sat for two hours in the dark. You know, everything's like, are you okay? Did you, were you sleeping? Did you have an okay time? You know, so. So the Mevlevis were founded in the 12th century, again, by Rumi, probably, you know, the preeminent uh, Sufi poet. And so, again, this is, this is what we think of, right? So first of all, the, the whirling is a form of what's called zakar, which simply means devotion, and it means worship. But there are a couple of things that I find really fascinating about the Mevlevis in, in particular. So these big tall hats that they wear, there's a symbolic meaning to this tall hat. It, it's meant to represent the tombstone. And it means a couple of things. It represents the death of the ego, so that you can you know, walk more fully in a space of love, so that you can connect with the divine outside of your ego construct. So that's one symbolic meaning behind the, the hat. The other is the fact it's a little bit of what's called memento mori, a reminder that we're all going to die. So don't take yourself too fucking seriously, because you're not going to be around that much longer. You know? So it keeps things in perspective. So that's, a, that's another aspect of it. And then you know, the, the fact that everything that we see, this is a very Zen-like you know, uh, concept, the fact that everything that we see is going to pass away, and that all forms are intransient and, or transient and, and impermanent, and that uh, you know, this is the world of delusion. And the divine world is the absolute reality. So that's the first thing. The other thing is you notice the hands. This is something else that we always see with the Sufis like this. Um, you know, it's almost a stereotypical kind of a pose, but there's an energetic meaning to that. What's happening is that the individual is bringing, and it's the other way around, it's right hand up. You bring the love of the divine down. It passes through your heart and you send it out to the world. So energetically, that's what the, uh, the dervishes, the whirly dervishes are, are doing. Um, I just, I love this picture. I love the fact, so, okay, I mean, let's just talk candidly. Islam can be a very hard religion. Many religions can, but in particular, when it comes to issues around the sexes and you know, feminism and these kinds of things, there are parts of Islam that are pretty messed up. Uh, you know, again, there are parts of many religions that are, that are pretty messed up, but the Sufis, they don't give a shit, <laughs> you know. As a matter of fact, the very first Sufi was a woman, and I'm going to talk about that here in, in just a minute. But uh, the Mevlevi order was founded by Rumi. He was walking through the market one day. And he heard goldsmiths ding, 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 hammering, you know, creating, uh, you know, doing metal work. 
And the sound reminded him of a phrase, one of the primary phrases in, in Islam, la ila ilawa, which means there is no God but God. And this is the first part of what's called the shahada, the profession of faith. faith. La ila ilawa, la ila ilawa. And so when he heard the hammering, he, in his mind, he heard this phrase. And he was so overtaken with joy that he just spontaneously began to spin in the marketplace. And that's when, you know, the Medlevi order was founded, and that's also where the tradition of the whirling dervishes first first started. start. So yeah, I just I like look how beautiful this, this girl is, this woman is. You know, this peaceful, transcendent expression on her face, and this freaky ass, <laughs> you know, tombstone kind of. You just got love it, so. Uh, so here's another, uh, uh, all of the poetry is, is from Ruby. Bird song brings relief to my longing. I'm just as ecstatic as they are, but with nothing to say. Please, universal soul, practice some song or something for me. Again, that's kind of the essence of Sufism, this longing to be a vessel for the divine, this longing to be a, a conduit for something greater than ourselves, and to bring you know, this, this ache, this hunger in our hearts into uh, contact with that universal source. So, so what is Sufism exactly? Uh, it's a sign from something. Uh, what, is, what is Sufism? Well, I, I don't really know what it is, but uh, I'll, I'll share with you some of the aspects of, of what it uh, is made up of or, or the qualities of it, right? So the first thing is, is that Sufism, obviously, is, is mystical. So what does that mean exactly? Well, to me, mysticism is when there's a, a, a fire in your heart, again, touching on that last bit of poetry. There's a fire in your heart that longs to be flamed by some sort of fan, by something greater than yourself. That's, that's the essence of the mystic, and that's the essence of, of mysticism. Um, Sufism is also scientific, believe it or not. Which sounds weird. It's like, well, aren't those things at odds with one another, science and, and mysticism? But I don't think that they are. And one of the things that the Sufis will tell you is that, first of all, that there is a clearly delineated path of evolution, of spiritual evolution. And you can tell where someone is on that path by the circumstances of their life. And it's the same for every seeker. And masters throughout time, not just in the Sufi tradition, but all over the planet, have identified this, this path as being the same. So there's a consistent part to this human experience. The other thing is that there are techniques that can bring about transcendent states of consciousness in a dependable, reproducible way. So it's not just a matter of you know, individual moments of, of uh, inspiration or, or transcendent awareness. By following a certain path of spiritual discipline, these states of consciousness can be produced dependently in people over and over again. And that's one of the things that when we get to the end, to the grave part, I'll be, I'll be sharing with you. Um, it's transcendent. Now what's the difference between transcendence and, and mysticism, or something being mystical and something being transcendent? Well, to me, if, it, if it's mystical, this is the impetus, this is, the, again, the, the fire that burns in your heart. If it's transcendent, this is actually the thing that lifts you up out of yourself and takes you into that contact with the divine. So in a way, mysticism is the rock fuel and transcendence is the thing that gets you out beyond the grip of gravity. And so Sufism is both. And this is a really key aspect of it. You're drawn to the Sufic path because of this, because of this ache. And then Sufism itself gives you the tools to be able to, you know, break free of the atmosphere, so to speak. Um, and then the last thing is, is that Sufism is inclusive. And this, is, again, is one of the things that I absolutely love about it. And, and I find this, you know, this is my deal. Like, I travel the world, I do crazy shit, I go into churches, I go into synagogues, I go to mosques, I go to old, you know, secret sites or whatever. And, uh, hi. Um, 
So one of the things that I, that I really love about Sufism is that it doesn't matter that I, I, I'm this color, or that my name is Greg, or that I'm an American, or, and they don't care what I believe. It's utterly immaterial to me being welcome in a Sufi mosque or a Sufi gathering, or whatever the case may be. And, and you don't find that in, in too many parts of the world. To continue our definition of, of Sufism, so the first thing is, is that the phrase Sufi only, or Sufism, only came into kind of existence about 100 years after the death of Muhammad. So Muhammad and his first companions, they didn't talk about the distinction between the exoteric and the, es and, and the esoteric. They didn't talk about, well, these are the outside rules and the laws of the religion, and this is you know, the spiritual reality that's inside each of us. There was a, they lived in a continuum of these things. So it was only about 100 years after Muhammad's death that somebody came along and said, wait a minute, this is all messed up. You guys are out of touch with the truth, you know, that, that should be happening spiritually inside of each of us. So in truth, the first Sufi was Muhammad himself. And Muhammad and his companions all lived a, a Sufic lifestyle. Yeah? So as I said, the first Sufi was actually a woman, and I'll talk about her in, in just a second. But so, the external form of Islam is called ulama, well, the, the people who, who uh, practice it and who kind of safeguard it are called the ulama. And they follow Sharia. We, we've probably heard of that. It has a very negative connotation here in the West because we associate it with a very extreme form of like radical Islam, Sharia law. But that's a distortion, that's a twisting. It's not you know, exactly accurate. But that's the external form. You know, these are the laws. You can't do this, you can't drink alcohol. Blah, 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 right? And that is in contrast to the Sufi. And the Sufi practices Tariqa, which is the internal truth. That's the esoteric. So, as I said, Muhammad and his companions were Sufi in all but name. And it was only about a hundred years after Muhammad died that this woman, Rabia of Basra, who was born in 717, she was the first Sufi. She was the first person to use the term Sufi and to point out this distinction between the ulama and the Sufi, between Sharia and Tariq. And to point out, hey, you guys are fucked up because you're up here, you're wrong-headed. You need to be right-hearted. So that's when Sufism was born. And that's the essence of Sufism, to be right-hearted, not to be wrong-headed. Because everybody in their beliefs thinks they're right. We think we're right, you know? When you feel the resonance of truth in your heart, and you go, oh, well, I was an ass. How could I possibly have thought that about another human being? So, so now, so, so that was my progression, right? I had this, this tremendous experience in this crazy, uh, you know, armor fight in, the, in the, the tomb of the dead king in the armor fight mosque when this guy is, you know, singing this Sufi chant. Had no expectation that it was going to resonate me, with me the way that it did. Then I see the dervishes in Cairo and I'm so transported that I can't even keep my eyes open. And this is when my friends say, this was the first time that I really comprehended or even it was introduced to the idea of being a Sufi, of Sufism. And my friend says, are you a Sufi? You're a Sufi. What are you talking about? What is that? You know, it's crazy. Man. And then, you know, uh, coming here to the States, seeing the Sufis from Turkey, and, you know, my, uh, the, the title on that slide was, was Somber Joy. It's the Medlevis and, and related orders, you notice that they all dress in white, they're very, like, you know, in contrast to these amazing colors that you see in, in you know, Egypt. And so now, Morocco is where, like, all this stuff comes together in the most phenomenal way. So the first thing is, is that the barrier, so to speak, between being a, a quote-unquote performer and being in the audience dissolves completely. Now, remember, I said, you know, I realized when I was watching these guys in Cairo, they're not performing, they're worshiping, they really feel these things, you know. 
But still, somehow there's a divide. It's like you watch, they spin or do whatever, you know. In Morocco, you become absolutely a part of the experience, a part of the worship. And you know, if, if you think about geographically where Morocco is located, it's the most western part of North Africa. And so culturally, Morocco is this just staggering accumulation of all these different different influences. It has equatorial Africa, it has Berber, it has Spanish, it has um, uh, Arabic, uh, Islamic, uh, it has Mediterranean. All of this comes together culturally in Morocco, and you, you find this, this incredibly rich Sufi spiritual heritage. And the Sufis have a tremendous influence all throughout the Islamic world, but in particular in Morocco. Um, and we don't think about that. You know, if, if you're familiar with the Sufis, you think of them as being like these mystic, crazy guys or crazy people that kind of keep off to themselves. But in truth, they are they're hugely influential, and in particular in North Africa and in this in this part of the world. And music becomes one of the cornerstones of this experience and this kind of worship. I'm just gonna let this play. centuries in Morocco when uh, Islam came to Morocco came to a place called Mula Idris and this was a sacred city it's only in the last few decades that Mula Idris has even been opened up to uh, Westerners 
And out of Mullah Idris came this tradition of Isawak, which took all of these different musical influences from North Africa, from Equatorial Africa, and somehow kind of merged them together into this trance form of, of experience. This celebration lasts five hours. And, and that's all you do is you just dance like a mad person for five hours. And there's no way that on you know a piece of electronic equipment that you can reproduce the vibrational experience of these musicians playing live in the space. It, you know the, the effect that it has on your body, even almost on the cellular level, is really just profound. But this is something that we find all throughout both spiritualism and, and mysticism, but in particular in the ancient world. This understanding about music and sound affect us and affect our states of consciousness. So for example, Newgrange in Ireland. I'm going to totally shift like cultures, time periods, right? The Newgrange in, I in Ireland is one example where they know that this structure, when the wind blows, it actually produces subsonic sound, sound that's below the threshold of human hearing. And we know from research that if you expose the human body to subsonic sound, it produces altered states of consciousness. So this is something that ancient people understood very well. And again, this to them was a spiritual science. They knew how to create you know, these transcendent altered states of awareness. So stop and think about it. This rhythmic kind of thing that you do, what's it like? It's like sex. You know, and this is one of the things that happens, is that certain portions of our brain get engaged. And the sense of self, the boundaries of self, begin to, to dissolve. And you find yourself in a larger space of, of awareness. And it's no different than a modern rave. You know, what are you doing? You're like, bah, you know, for, for hours on end. And, and so this is, a, you know, a, a rave. It's a, it's a freaking rave that's seven centuries old. And there's no electronica, there's no house music, nobody needs to drop E. And, you know, it's all like just completely freaking natural. This was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, was to be at this Isawa Lila. Lila, by the way, is the Arabic word just for night. So Isawa night. And um, the, the Moroccan women, and we were really lucky because we were half Westerners and half Moroccans. If we had all been Westerners, we never we, we wouldn't have known what to do. We wouldn't have known what we were allowed to do. We wouldn't have been able to like really cut loose and freak out and spin and fall and do all this crazy stuff, you know? Because our, our cultural perceptual boundaries would have been here, not out there where they needed to be. But immediately, when when this ceremony began and the Moroccans started to just like lose their stuff, all the Westerners went, oh. You know, I could be a kid, I can cut, I can just let it go, and it doesn't matter. With the Moroccan women, their, their dresses, they have these big, thick, huge belts that they wear. And the reason that they do that is someone will stand behind them and hold them by this belt. And they can just completely lose themselves in the music and movement and whatever their bodies want to do with impunity and know that they're not going to fall down or you know, run into somebody else. Or, um, I mean, this, this was a, a truly beautiful, revelatory, for me, life-changing experience. And so now, I'm, I'm going back, I'm, I'm leading a, a trip in April to the Sufi festival in Fez. This, this took place in Fez, in what's called a Riyadh, which is a traditional um, Moroccan house. Riyadh is the word for paradise, appropriately. This is so gorgeous, man, so really. Beauty, architecturally beautiful. And, and Mohammed Azizi Fez and his Isawa group will be the people doing our Isawa Lila. And uh, it's four months away, and I, I can't wait. Um, so that is a, a Sufi rave. And you saw me, I spun to the point where I got. I have to sit down now, you know. Um, and again, here's more rooming that just captures you know, the essence of that experience. 
Sometimes the lover of God may faint in the presence. Then the beloved bends and whispers in his ear, Beggar, spread out your robe, I'll fill it with gold. And I saw that so clearly that night of the of the Isawar. You know, literally these people just reaching these states of of transport, of, of bliss through this combination of music and uh, call and response chanting. And, and movement, and, and you know, having the freedom, having the permission to be able to do this. And after an hour, or two, or three, your body and your mind and your spirit just can't help but respond to this combination of things in a way that's you know, incredibly powerful. There's no other word for it. Um, so uh, that's it. That's 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 my talk. Uh, like I said, um, in April I am leading a group to Morocco, and uh, I'm so proud. I've not been this excited about a place in a really long time. And I'm a lucky guy, you know. I travel all over the world. I go to some cool freaking places, man. But very few of them are as cool as Morocco. And this has been, a, again, a real revelation to me. So I, I spent about six weeks there over the past um, four or five months building this trip and researching and visiting places and putting it all together. And uh, this, for instance, is one of the places that, that we will be visiting and, and staying. This is, um, uh, this, that's a Casbah, that's what that is. <laughs> so, you know, rock the Casbah, and you're always going like, what the fuck's a Casbah? Well, that's what that's it, right? You know? So, uh, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, dates from the 13th century. These walls are built from, you know, red mud, and they dissolve when it rains. It doesn't rain very often. Um, and this is on the uh, ancient uh, caravan route from the Sahara to Fez. This place is uh, kind of midway, it's a, it's a stopping off point. And so yeah, so like I said, when it rains, the walls melt and they rebuild them. So if you want to get in touch with me, this is my uh, email. This is the Sahara, it's one of the things that we'll be doing, is we'll be riding camels out into the Sahara, dining with the Berbers under the stars. Um, this is my email, Greg, at SpiritQuest Tours. Uh, this is my company's website, spiritquesttours.com. And if you want to find out more about Morocco, just slash Morocco. And if you know anybody has any questions, if you know, I, you know, I just love like talking about travel, culture, spirit, spirituality. Travel with me, don't travel with me. If you want pointers about any place in the world and I can help, drop me an email. I'm, I'm happy to do so. Okay? Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.